Right, this is a return to an earlier subject, which is our Welsh holiday, which we had uh, in February. We got to several castles. I've already put up Chepstow and Caerphilly, but I've been saving one of the better ones until later. And we're now up to Raglan Castle. Raglan Castle was built in the middle years of the 15th century. And as such, it makes a particular... Um, uh, contrast with one I showed you in an earlier film the the absolutely awful Baconsthorpe Castle in uh, Norfolk Baconsthorpe Castle was th thrown up as a uh, attempt by a, uh, a shyster lawyer to make himself look good but it's built mostly with field flint and uh, brick and it's altogether shabby Ragland on the other hand is almost a quantum leap in terms of design, in terms of having decent material, in terms of, of being a castle. Now I've got uh, an earlier drawing here, which you should be able to see clearly, um, but I think we will switch to the color one, which makes a little bit more sense here. Now, we can zero in, yes. I think the colour one's going to be the one we want. Careful reading of the history suggests this was a, um, a, a modern bailey. And if this island here in the, in the moat is the mot, then it's possible that the outer part here, which is uh, effectively two wards, this outer section here may have been the original Norman circle of walls, probably even without towers. Uh, William Herbert's father, who had a Welsh name, which was maybe an attempt, uh, was a social climber. The Herberts were borderline brigands down in South Wales in the middle 1450s. Uh, but William himself adopted an anglicised name and threw himself behind Edward, Edward Duke of York who was uh, later to become Edward IV. And William Herbert fought alongside him at uh, the Battle of Mortimer's Cross, which is not a million miles from here. So what do we have? We have the Great Tower itself here, which is marked in grey, and that is one of the earliest structures on site. There's also some indications that other early material and the South Gate, which will be referred to on film, is there. Then, um, following his victory at Mortimer's Cross, uh, we have a major building phase where all this brown goes up. And on top of that, again, we have uh, 18th, uh, Elizabethan and Stuart developments to turn part of this into a palace. There's a long gallery put in, very fashionable in Elizabethan times, etc. But in this stage, uh, what I'm interested in, which is the Wars of the Roses period, we have um, circle of walls, this great tower, and copious provision for uh, gunpowder weapons. Now, what you will hear me refer to on the soundtrack sometimes is handgun, and sometimes using the term ultralight artillery. It's debatable which was used from what, but the circular ports, which are about yay big uh, probably had a gun barrel laid on a, a wooden sledge and the gun barrel was probably capable of firing projectiles about the size of a tennis ball or somewhat larger and that's what I tend to call an ultra light artillery piece uh, when you see the gun ports uh, do an internal view of one you can see there's no way you could ever have had wheels on it it was simply a wooden sledge, maybe even just an iron tube, laid on the ground, touched off, and you can almost think of it in terms of being a, a medieval claymore. Directional blast of small fragments, a round shot, whatever they could, were capable of firing. Then above that you get a cross-shaped um, crossbow loop, but each one has got round things on it, which again would allow somebody with a hand weapon to fire from there. So what we're dealing with 
is a very, very sophisticated building. The development of this possible Norman Mott into this great, very tall tower allows them to cross fire the older entrance, which is this grey one, now referred to as the South Gate. Very simple design, almost Norman, which when the rest of the castle was developed, this turned into a postern. And over here we have this magnificent, and it is, it, it's a stun, it's a stunner, covered, covered with uh, heraldic achievements, the heraldry of the Herbert family. The Herberts were going somewhere. They thrown themselves behind Edward IV. Edward IV became king, and they were doing pretty well until, um, unfortunately, uh, they fell foul of the Earl of Warwick, and of course, ultimately, William Herbert was executed, or killed. So, Raglan Castle in South Wales, if you ever get a chance to get out there, visit it, it is superb. Lovely design. Um, I think it's one of the most functional uh, castles of its period, and one of the most functional castles of the crossover between um, crossbows and longbows on one hand and gunpowder weapons be they handguns or ultralight artillery on the other if you get a chance to get down there go and see it well, this is the rather handsome building known as Raglan Castle it's in South Wales near the town of Raglan this was built by um, the Herbert family, but they weren't originally called Herbert. Um, William Herbert fought alongside uh, Edward, of Duke of York, at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. At the time that uh, Mortimer's Cross took place, that great tower over there, that structure, certainly existed. Uh, that had been built by William Herbert's father. William Herbert's father had a Welsh name, and that um, was a bad thing in 15th century England. So William Herbert uh, anglicised his name, became um, a prominent supporter of the Yorkists, and his Yorkist connections allowed him to build this. And this is a palatial castle. Um, for those of you who have seen my earlier film on Baconsthorpe Castle, built in exactly the same period as this, uh, I decried the quality of Baconsthorpe Castle and said that uh, it was poorly built. Uh, this is built in exactly the same period and this makes Baconsthorpe Castle look like a shed. So Raglan Castle, South Wales. Right, this is the Great Tower at Raglan. The inner portion which you can see straight ahead of us here is the oldest and was built by William Herbert's father but following the principles of concentric defence at a later date possibly William Herbert himself this lower outer wall was added and the principles of concentric defence is always kept quite low so if an enemy gets over it they can then be shot down upon quite easily. Panning back this way, you can see a huge hole in the main tower. That unfortunately was done uh, after the English Civil War to prevent it being uh, reused. This is known as slighting. Panning across this way, we're back to the gatehouse. And if you look very carefully there, you can see lines of circular holes. They are in fact gun loops, circular gun loops uh, to allow handguns to fire out in different angles. Some of them aren't very practical. And one of them, which you might be able to see in just in this area, is actually in, in the area where the guard robe is, the toilet, and it comes out into the moat, there's a little archway, and that is the guard robe exit. So this is the, the great palatial um, new entrance, but around the back there's an earlier entrance which was probably the, the first one built by William Herbert's father. Right. This is some indication of what, how building material can affect what you build. 
my previous film at Baconsthorpe showed uh, a castle built with field flints um, obtained locally from the fields, just dug up, ploughed up, and then to which some brickwork has been added. Here, uh, William Herbert had access to decent stone, and the result is this quality of work. Uh, there's the circular handgun loops. These fire out across this inner moat, which protects the great tower, while on the other side, they also cross fire the main entrance where we are now. And up above, you've got this magnificent machicolation, which is uh, means by which fire can be directed down towards the base of the walls or even objects and gunfire, crossbow fire directed vertically, and that is machicolation. There was some, probably some over the main entrance here, but the uh, parliamentary forces have ripped off the entrance uh, after the English Civil War to try and make the castle less defendable. And if anybody recognises this from the film uh, Henry V, Kenneth Branagh, for it was he, comes riding out of here at the so-called Siege of Harfleur, and he does the whole once more onto the breach, dear friends, once more speech, more or less where I'm standing now. So this doubled for half fleur in the film Henry V. The main gatehouse here had at least two portcullises, gates and a drawbridge. There is one portcullis slot there, hiding in the shadows. Gate behind it, uh, some evidence of drawbar holes, etc. Over here, if you're using the gate as a uh, airlock arrangement, let people through the first one, but you're not going to let people through the second one. You can talk to them, investigate who they are, or, or if you don't like them, shoot at them. Now the second portcullis is located inside this gorgeous dressed stone here. Second portcullis there, and behind here, evidence of another gate closing there and if I miss my guess correctly there was almost certainly another gate in this area now interestingly this gate closes against anything from that side so it does mean that uh, if your garrison on this side mutinied, you can actually stop them getting out. This gate uh, closes against that jam and the, the hinges go back that way. In the interior, this is a great palatial building, partly built by William Herbert later, but also with extensive Elizabethan detailing. Um, not really in my great period, but they've superimposed uh, Elizabethan buildings, particularly on this side, and you can tell the Elizabethan work because you've got these much bigger windows there. That tends to indicate the building has now turned more into a palace than a, um, a palace or stately home rather than a castle. We are here standing in the great gatehouse and we're looking across the moat to the great tower over there. In an earlier period this might have been referred to as a keep but in this phase it's referred to as a great tower. It's residential and defensive. Again you can see crosslet shaped um, loops there which could favour either crossbow or handgun. If you look up onto the wall above the gate, you can see the, if I pan that back to there, you can see the great slots in the wall where the beams once went up into those slots when the uh, drawbridge was raised. And unusually, this great tower over there has actually got evidence of two doorways. A double doorway, which had the main um, uh, drawbridge on it and a smaller single doorway 
um, indicating that they can have effectively like a wicket gate effect. Right, this is known as the fountain court um, due to the presence later in the 16th century of an elegant fountain out there in the centre. But if we were following normal um, castle nomenclature, this would probably be the outer ward with the newer inner ward over there with the great gateway beyond. Behind me, here, there's a flight of stairs leading up to this entrance here. And this is the entrance up into the Great Tower, which stands at its own little island over there. This is the extremely unusual entrance into uh, the Great Tower at Raglan Castle. Um, best way to describe this is as two side-by-side -side drawbridges. You've got the main one that goes in through that central arch there. The drawbridge is cantilevered up using beams which reside in the slots here and here. However, if they didn't want to open the main gate, there was originally a second gate on this side which cantilevered up into one slot. So you've effectively got a side-by-side -side gate effect and I'm now going to take us over to a little drawing here which gives you some idea of how it might have looked in working order. Timber bridge that we're standing on, well it's now stone that we're on now and you've got the, the first main bridge going up and a second little pedestrian bridge next to it. And there's another example of it in later use there. By that stage, it's been reduced to just to one, one um, single bridge only. We've just emerged from a sally port at the base of the Great Tower. The exterior ditch facing over towards the main gate that we came in on is over there. However, I'm here to have a look at one of the slots in detail. The top slot there is clearly intended for crossbow, but the large circles will allow a handgun to fire out the side. And beneath, you have a larger circle, which could be used for an ultra light artillery piece. This is possibly the cleverest embrasure I have ever seen. Lower port there, the round one, is to allow an ultralight artillery piece to be laid along here and fired outwards, belching out round shot or uh, bags full of stones, etc. Above, we have a cross-shaped port. The round things allow you to fire a handgun through, but these slots either side could be to allow a, um, a crossbowman to lean to one side or lean to the other and not have his crossbow weapon foul against the wall. So you've got a, a three-way handgun and crossbow at the top, ultralight artillery piece at the bottom. There were gorgeous interior buildings here. There was a fireplace there, fireplace there, all of course destroyed later, probably after the siege. But I'm gonna zero in on that piece up there, just there. That is another big fireplace. And look at the quality of the sculpture there. That was surrounded, a fireplace probably built, I'm guessing 16th century, tapped into the earlier walls. So gorgeous ornamental fireplace. The other half, of course, now being lost. And then this archway here leads through into the more palatial range. And above this was severely altered in Elizabethan times to turn it into more of a palace. Ahead of us, we have the South Gate. Um, it would have functioned later as a postern 
or second gateway out onto this side of the castle. Uh, as you can see, the Great Tower, which is one of the earliest features here, still manages to crossfire this gate as well as the other one over there, just visible in the gap between here. So the Great Tower crossfires both gateways. This south gate may have been the original main gate in. There's evidence from the construction that there was um, a plain circle of stone put around here. This is the gateway in, then leading to the Great Tower. But most conventional dating places the Great Tower as the first structure. That was certainly here at the time of Mortimer's Cross, Battle of Mortimer's Cross, and possibly that gateway and those walls were here as well. But the great palatial buildings on the far side appear to be post Mortimer's Cross. We're here beside the Great Tower. I'm about to show you the depth of the moat, looking down into there. Again, you've got a low wall running around, which was added on later. Following the principal's concentric defense, you have a low wall in front of your inner wall. And if the enemy gets in, you can then shoot down onto him uh, and he can't gain any benefit from this low wall. It's great for defense, no good for the attackers. Over there, you can see where there was once a double drawbridge into the Great Tower. And then looking here, Vern Zero in just there, you can see a crossbow loop, cross-shaped crossbow loop, and below that, a handgun uh, port. Uh, that indicates that uh, this wall in front here was probably not there when that handgun loop was put in, because if that wall is up to full height in front, then that handgun loop and that crossbow uh, slot lose their field of fire outwards. Um, so instead it's been replaced by that crossbow port there. Um, yeah, so some indication that this, this lower wall was put in later because it blinds the field of fire for that port there. Some indication of the opulence of the decoration at Raglan Castle. You can see how much heraldry has been incorporated above this rather ornate window. Uh, facing the, the main uh, great tower and covering this window next to the original gateway that we came in on. Um, William Herbert definitely threw some serious money at this. Look at look at the detail. Uh, as I said earlier, I filmed at Baconsthorpe Castle, which is made of field flint and brick, and this makes Baconsthorpe Castle look like a outside toilet. This has been a Warspite production. If you've enjoyed this, please leave a thumbs up. If you've really enjoyed it, please feel free to subscribe. I look forward to seeing you next time. This is Warspite out and have a very good day.